All right, let's continue. Everybody taking a seat. All right, here's a test question. When was the last murder in Zermatt? You guys remember? 64, right? Good job. You cannot hear? Hey, okay, let's sit down. You really need to continue. The whole world is watching and they're on time. We have like 10 million people watching those presentations. Come on, just sit down, sit down, sit down. It's two more hours. It's going to be the best two hours of your whole medical career. Hey, I start to yodel if you guys don't sit down. Come on, 30 more seconds. 25, 22. All right, perfect. So about the fondue tonight, the cows are milked. Big applause for the cows. Woo. <laughs> so it's going to be a logistical nightmare, so many of you guys. So for tonight, the fondue starts at 8 p.m. upstairs. It's going to be quite a few of you guys, so very impressive. But please leave the jackets down here and go up without the jackets. It's going to be a little cozy. I think it's going to be okay. Um, everybody's paying their fee at the restaurant after, after dinner. Okay, so don't disappear, please. And that's about it. Thank you. Welcome back. So we now segue smoothly into trauma. I've got the first of two trauma sessions for you now. So this will see you up to lunch. Time for a little bit of a ski and then the evening session. The evening session is going to be presented by some of my colleagues from London Hems and they're going to talk to you uh, about hemorrhage and, and some of the granularity within that. But before that, I think we've got an absolute highlight of a session coming for you now. We've got some really big names from around the world and some really interesting things to talk to you about. So I think you are in for a treat. Um, what you're not in for is me pronouncing um, names properly. But I've been, I've been given permission by the next speaker just to use his first name. So it's Gunnar for you. And he's an orthopedic uh, and spinal surgeon and a pelvic, sorry, an orthopedic um, and pelvic surgeon. And he's head of the department at the Karolinska um, University and he's head of the trauma unit there. And he is also very much into skiing, which probably is a good thing being up here, and also represents um, the Swedish uh, ski industry. Um, but today he's going to talk to you about pelvic fractures, and I think you're all far more interested to hear him than me. Works? Good. Well, I'm D. Gunnar, and I'm going to give you a lecture about these pelvic fractures. It might be uh, knocking on open doors, and s sometimes it might be that I can be controversial, which is the point, point here. How many in this room are not dealing with trauma? That's very good. So you can just relax and listen. <coughs> this is, by the way, it's a, it's a, it's a fracture from, it's a obviously a pelvic fracture, and it is from a, interesting enough, many, many years ago this is, and it was a patient who was a Jehovah's Witnesses, I was part of them, and that kind of brings a problem into the, into the fact that you're not permitted to give blood. And uh, we are kind of the center for these patients, so they come to us, and we have a mutual agreement. We do what they say, at least when it comes to grown-ups. <coughs> and that means also means that in, in this case, his life was probably saved by the fact that he, we didn't know when he came in. He borrowed a motorbike, and he had an injury, and obviously came in with this uh, fracture. You can see the femur fracture down there, too, and there are multiple fractures. And that's the thing with, with, the, with pelvic trauma. There's always something else to it most of the time. Uh, but interesting enough, I mean, we didn't know he was a Jehovah's Witnesses, and therefore we gave him about 17 units of blood at that time. This is the old days, uh, and, and uh, starting with two liters of clear fluids, and we were probably packing his pelvis, we were putting a pelvic sling on it, and there was uh, angiography, et cetera, et cetera, and all this blood. And then eventually the, the church showed up, telling me who it was, and he was then hoovering with the HP level of 60 for many months, in, in the intensive care unit until we stopped re, um, using the, giving him the, the um, dialysis. Then it started climbing up and he recovered eventually. So obviously it's, it's something, it comes to bleeding. I'm gonna bring two statements into this. And, and this is, my whole mission is now trying to change your minds 
And for sometimes, I mean, some people, this might be a knocking on open doors, and sometimes it might seem to be strange. The first thing is nobody dies from pellet fracture. It hasn't happened, and it's not going to happen. Even though the pellet fracture is the most lethal, lethal at least orthopedic trauma we can have, nobody dies from it. And the second thing is I want you to have a nagging fear in your brain in the future. Why do I accept the use of pelvic binding? And you can put these two sentences in your, in your brain, and eventually, my two uh, 15 minutes coming now, I'm going to convince you that I'm correct and you're wrong. <laughs> so if we start then, nobody dies from pelvic fracture. It's easy. They bleed to death. So that took everything away. It, and it might sound like I made kind of semantics, but it, it is, has some kind of purpose, really. I, do, I read a study quite recently when they had something like 250 trauma patients. They found something like 60 with pelvic injuries, and maybe they found the bleeding, <coughs> uh, they died from bleeding. Uh, all died from bleeding, up to one. And they said that was probably due to the pelvic fracture. Pelvic death is an interesting concept, because I think most of us agree that the, the anatomical position for death is really in the brain. Really. Some people might disagree. We took about maybe 200 years using the stethoscope, the last 40 years we're doing neurological examinations, trying to find out if we have brain death or not, if we have patients who are dead or not. And if, of course, this can occur either because it's a dreaming uh, or a bleed or the trauma within the brain, or it can be a bleed or a trauma without it, uh, outside the brain, or asphyxia, or maybe something nasty, not nasty passing the blood-brain bar barrier. But the thing is, the, the death is within the brain. And the interesting thing about this, this is what we focus on when we talk about pelvic trauma. These are all the devices. And you can say that it's, I mean, of course, it's bleed to death and it, it's, it's all in the brain, but we focus a lot on the fracture. It has nothing to do with, with, the, with the death. And there are so many devices now produce it. I mean, I was very scared doing this because I thought some of the people kind of sponsoring us would produce these things, but they're not, so they're trying to do it. And these top level, these are all pelvic slings, different model, combat on the right, and the flashy ones on the left. Uh, in the midterm, we have the so-called C-clamps. I was using this about 20 years ago before I discarded the system. Came in more modern version. It's more the Robocop type. And they all had the same kind of purpose. In an emergency situation, I need to do something about the pelvis. And the, the bottom is the, two, the, the different parts of external fixators doing the same thing. And there's lots and lots of money put into this and lots and lots of kind of adverts coming in. This is what you do when you, when you have a brain fracture. They're wrong. The thing is, we have to focus on how does the bleeding start? And how does the bleeding stop? And why doesn't it stop? That's the fundamentals for, from all, everything in trauma, basically what we're de dealing with. And you really have to think, I mean, the obvious is when, when the bleeding starts, there's a hole in the vessel. Small, large, veins, arteries, and maybe sometimes you can have a fracture that bleeds from, from the bone marrow, that occurs too, but otherwise it's, it's a, there's a hole in the vessel. And it stops, it, well, because of the, you have the coagulation system. You have the hemostasis on the primary, the secondary, you have the, the platelets coming and forming this little plug, you have the fibrin reinforcing the plug, you have the constriction of the vessels, and then it stops. And in my hospital, at least, we have a kind of large holes, and they're called surgical bleedings, and they have small holes, they're called medical bleedings. I know you have the same <laughs> thing. But that ha and that means that if there are small holes, it's not me, and then there's some, some that anesthetists or someone else have to fi figure out in, in the co coagulation system what can we do to stop this then it stops. And why does it con or continue? Well, of course, this didn't work. And then coming that back to the pelvic sling or the external fixators of the pelvic fracture. <coughs> when I started med school, I was told that the reason why, why the, the pelvic fracture was so lethal, because it normal, normally it kind of contains a certain amount of, of blood. And when you uh, made a, have an open, um, open book fracture, then obviously there's a lots, lots and lots of more blood was possible to store there because it, it was a volume that, it, that was so large that people blurted to death. And this has been tested by someone who's called Buck and they did it in 2005. He took cadavers and it, then he did, measured how, I mean, how much blood can you contain within the cadaver, in, in the true pelvis. And then he made a, maybe an open book fracture. And it, then he looked again, how much can you contain now? Pretty basic. And before, the, I mean, normally it's about 800 cc or so within it. And after doing the pelvic fracture, then you can 200 cc more. 
13 tablespoons that we can contain. So it's not about volume. It's absolutely nothing to do with the pellet structure. So we can discard that as, as a reason. So what is it then? Well, then you can continue, and especially if you have these kind of tractors, these, all these, these kind of type uh, pelvic tractors can all bleed. Plus 200, minus 200, maybe plus minus zero, nothing. All these bleed, but it's nothing to do with volume either, here either. Then we start to think maybe it's pressure, and you have a Boyle's law, and you know that the volume and the pressure is a constant. That means if you have a large pelvis with, with lots of blood in it, and you can reduce it with a pelvic sling, then you will start higher pressure, which then stops the bleeding has been done too. In t uh, 1998, Grimm did that study. Cadavers again. And this time he, put <coughs> he, he measured the pressure within the pelvis. He put a, a catheter from arthroscopy in, into the pelvis and then he could infuse fluid and measure the, uh, the pressure at the same time. What he found out that when a norm normal cadaver, the one liter it, it was about 30 millimeters uh, of, of mercury. Five liters, and you can see how everything, the soft tissues now expand within the pelvis. The uh, pressure was 21. With six liters, it was 35. Fair enough. And then he created this, this open book fracture. And now what, what happens? Well, 20 liters into the pelvis, which just contained these 13 tablespoons. And the pressure was just 36, which is quite interesting. The more interesting thing is that afterwards he closed it again. He did a closed book. It was a normal pelvis. And now... 20 liters, or sorry, there we go. 20 liters and about the same pressure. Closing the book did absolutely nothing. Not to the volume, not to the pressure, not to anything. And now we had to focus on more things. And the interesting thing is, and of course you can see, this is also again our, our Jehovah's Witnesses guy. You can see that you have the blue things and the red things, and obviously you have lots of blood coming from here. These are the kind of low pressure bleedings from the, from the, uh, from the pelvis itself. Uh, they're kind of driven by the, by I, the <coughs> IDP pressure, 10, 15, 12, 8, wh wherever you are. And so are the, the venous leakages also driven by that. And we can see that here, obviously, there was the low pressure bleedings from, from the pelvis, the low pressure bleedings from the veins, maybe in this area, and all high pressure bleedings maybe from the femoral artery, maybe from the decreased sacral arteries, maybe from the uh, posterior gluteal artery, or maybe from, from the pudendal artery. It's a possibility that these bleed. So then you have low pressure bleedings and you have high pressure bleedings, and with an intra, intra, intra pelvic pressure of 45, you know you can stop the low pressure bleedings just by compressing the veins. But the arteries will continue to bleed because you can't exceed the pressure anyhow, no matter what you do with the pelvic fracture. Boring, isn't it? My friend Anna did a study. This is for you, Ross. Uh, this is not that long. It's about um, 2018. She took about 500, five years period, about 500, 50 trauma patients in our hospital. And they kind of the, the criteria was uh, high energy. It was supposed to be a blood pressure below 100 on arrival. It was supposed to be a pelvic fracture with a bleeding with, within it. These were kind of uh, uh, the inclusion criteria. By doing that, she divided the, the, the pelvis and the whole body up in different regions and did the CT scans on all these patients and see where did the blood go. And interesting enough that but only two, three of all these 60 patients that had the, had the bleedings within pelvis were limited to the, to the pelvis. The rest were bleeding somewhere else. 83% gluteal, 58% abdominal, and uh, in abdominal regions, 42% were parabrethral and 55% on the flank. It went everywhere. The only thing you could stop by uh, adjusting the pelvis maybe with a low pressure bleeding within the pelvis. The fracture, the, the veins that are kind of torn within the true pelvis could be stopped with the, uh, the, with the pelvic binding or a preventative surgery. Whatever you want to do to kind of address the fracture. So then the question is, how does the bleeding start? Well, obviously, when you have this, when we see, I mean, you have all seen YouTube clips when people kick boxers or kick, uh, break their legs and it just looks absurd. In, in the when they when they fracture and then reduce themselves and it looks pretty okay. When we see an XCT scan or a fracture uh, or a fracture, then obviously it's a it's a spontaneous reduced fracture. It's in the moment of trauma, it looks bizarre, and then it kind of reduces itself. And in the bizarre moment, the, the vessels are torn, either the arteries or the vein, either with the help of fractures from 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 the, the fracture fragments from the pelvis or from the pelvis itself. But that's when the bleeding starts. And the question, how is that to stop? Well, it's coagulation system again. And in the first moments of everything, I mean, obviously the, the cascade starts 
when the in intrinsic, extrinsic systems, all the things trying to fight the bleeding, eventually running out of, of fibrin, uh, running out of everything basically, so you have a lack of coagulation uh, <coughs> factors and you have uh, open vessels and everything, and obviously then the bleeding doesn't stop and we have to address it. What can we do to stop the bleeding? So then the question comes really, is this little puppet going to save the brain? <coughs> None of you thinks that. Obviously, I'm very categoric. Obviously, it can be that, I mean, if you put this on, you can stop the low pressure bleedings. Blood is not fluid. It was at those days when we gave uh, two liters of ringer. Nowadays, we give a lot of transfusion packets. We give a lot of blood in the beginning. We form blood clots even within the pelvis. Maybe we can raise the, 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 the pressure more than 45 nowadays, but we don't know that. No one has proved it, no one has shown it, and I'm still a bit doubtful to that. So what, when you're putting this on, you should realize that you're doing what you can to do. That is probably not going to help in most of the cases. It gives you some kind of help, it gives you maybe gives you a bit of time. If you have a short traveling time, then of course it, it, um, it won't do you anything to go at, at all. If you have a long transport, maybe hours, an hour or something, Maybe you need to do this if you have a hydrodynamic or unstable patient and a pelvic fracture. Of course, if you have a pelvic fracture with normal blood pressure, you don't need to do anything. And if, and if you radiology, if you do a CT of, of a pelvis and the radiologist says, this is an unstable pelvic fracture, then you shouldn't get worried. Of course, nothing is happening. People have pelvic fractures and they heal, like all fractures in the body. If they bleed, it's because the vessels are torn and they need to address them. If they do not bleed, you haven't got any problems at all. So therefore, we really have to have answer these two, two questions. Do we have a, um, a, a circ 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 problems with the circulation? Or do I have a problem with the pelvis? Can I combine these two? Can I do something about it? Most of the, of the bleedings are somewhere else. Uh, blood and fluorine form more, as you know. I mean, thorax, abdominal bleedings are much more common. The pelvic bleedings are quite rare. So therefore, it's very rare that you do something with the fluorine. And usual question to say after a while is, is, is there any drawbacks with the, with, the, with the pelvic sling? Maybe. If you have a fracture like this, and you're putting a pelvic sling there, you have a lateral uh, compression injury to, to the pelvis, and you push, if you're putting a sling on this, you will push this fragment all in, and sometimes this is going to meet that. And you're going to compress everything there, it's there. All the vessels that might have been torn are certainly going to be torn now. And if you have a fracture like this, this acetabular fracture, you're putting a pelvic sling on this, even it might seem like it's a pelvic fracture, there might have a bleeding within it, but all you can do now is push the, the, push the femoral head right into the, the pelvis, destroying everything within, within inside, and have an irre irreducible fracture afterwards. Until we, and these are the, the uh, is it 44 hours of a pelvic sling? It looks like this. So, Closing everything now then, I think I have you. I think you believe that nobody dies from their pelvic fracture, not just because it's magic, they don't. And you should always have this nagging feeling within yourself. Whenever you see uh, the, the course you're going to, when the general surgeons talk to you, when, when, when uh, the, the, the trauma surgeons decide what to do and they say we should put it on the, on, on the pelvic sling, it should hurt. You should question it within yourself. If you start to tell them uh, loudly, they will start to spit on you, they will follow you, and they will hate you. But I think we now have to be part of this movement all together and stop, st stop doing stupid things, start to think, why does it bleed and what can I do about it? Thank you. I, uh, No I love that. Um, I love that last bit there. Stop doing stupid things and start to think. I think that's a that's a fantastic allegory for medicine and life. Um, any questions? There's one at the back there. The mic is coming to you. Yes. Hello. Thank you. Uh, what are your thoughts on log rolling patients with uh, suspected pelvic fractures? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, there are so many. There's also these things. Obviously, this study hasn't been done. It's like um, the, the rule nowadays that only one person can feel the, the pelvic fracture, and if it's unstable or not, or maybe no one. Because then you can, the, the blood clots can come loose, and then they just start to bleed again. No one has done that study. 
Some have been thinking about it. Um, someone who's been important enough has been putting that into the ATLS team, and then it, it's, it's a rule nowadays. I don't buy it. I think you can feel the pelvis. Of course, it's stupid to do it all, obviously all over and over again, and it hurts, and it, why do you have to, to kind of move the fragments in, under in when it's not needed? And the same thing with log rolling. I mean, if you need to do it, I mean, nowadays it's a question if you should do it at all because of the kind of the movement of the spine, but if you do it anyhow, then where d is it unstable? If you can do a, 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 um, a radiology in the, in the emergency room, obviously then it's easy to say this is a stable side and this is not. But I, don't, I wouldn't be too, I mean, if you need to do this, uh, you have to have penetrating wood at the back, for example, then of course you should do it. Uh, I don't think that will do anything about the fracture, not the bleeding either. But that's me. Uh, I really appreciate that perspective. Uh, uh, I'm Stacy Chapel from New York Military. We reviewed the world's literature on pelvic binders a couple years ago and sort of came to the opposite conclusion. Um, uh, our population's a little bit different with the, you know, the dismounted glass type of injuries and the amputations. But um, the thing that struck me as, a mar as remarkable is there was absolutely not a single study done on pre-hospital pelvic binder placement. And all of the conclusions that we have to come to, uh, you know, your interpretation of the crappy literature that's out there, our interpretation of the crappy literature out there, you know, we really need that study of pre-hospital pelvic binder placement to see if it actually makes a difference. I agree with you totally. And the problem is it's very hard to do, do uh, research in trauma if you want kind of randomized studies. And it's, I mean, how do you have the permit from the patient? I mean, et cetera, et cetera. So, and we have been trying to do that. I was in, in talk with, with a hospital in, in uh, Austria in Gantz, now it's not that long, but half a year ago, and they have a totally system, different system. They have pre-hospital pelvic binders. In Stockholm, we had said no, because we're kind of strong-minded. Uh, so we have kind of co same same size, maybe the same kind of hospital, and, th and that's the closest we can get, really. Can we see, see any difference? It's very hard to do that study, too, really. I mean, it's large volumes you need, all the different aspects of it. You have the same transfusion protocols, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So even then, it's very hard to do the study. I agree with you, and that's a problem. I mean, I, I wrote a book about orthopedic trauma about 20 years ago, and then it contained all the diagnoses, I mean, all the kind of 250 different orthopedic trauma diagnoses you can have. And if you want to really know what's true or, uh, true or wrong there, you start at page one, because we have no idea. Everything is based on what someone has told us, and this seems to be working and in my hands and so on. But the good studies, they aren't there in trauma at all, really. It's very hard to do. Any other questions? Ah, one more back down there. I love this debate. I think this is fantastic. This is this is yeah. what this conference <laughs> is about. Because if, yeah. if the Please answers were simple and the answers were there, then we wouldn't have to do this. We just read yeah. the book. Thank you very much for the controversial statement. Um, I'm an anesthetist, so I'm naturally um, curious about uh, any uh, surgeon statements. So I'm I'm not <laughs> fully fully convinced um, <laughs> since. The guidelines, um, uh, they, they say be sensitive about using pelvic binders if there is pain in the pelvic or the trauma mechanism is, um, is, is, is right, you, you should put on one. Um, do you really rely on the blood pressure as the diagnostic tool to say the patient is stable, he doesn't need a pelvic binder? Well, I, I would not re rely on it in a... Well, yes and no, in the way, I mean, since I don't believe in pelvic binders, I wouldn't care. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that's also me, and uh, since I'm, I'm, I'm the head of a department, I mean, everyone thinks like me. <laughs> at, least, at least when I see them. But, I mean, obviously, I mean, what you want to know, is it bleeding or not? And, and, and then it all comes down to, to, the, to, to uh, blood gases and, uh, and, and lactate and so on. I mean, this has nothing to do with blood pressure at all, really. Especially not in a young person when we have all these kind of mechanisms that make the blood pressure high for a very, very long time. So we have to rely on everything. And I'm glad you're saying that's an I mean, the thing is, I mean, surgery is doing lots of good things about pelvic fracture. And surgeons have done a very lot of good things when it comes to find the big holes, basically. That's what we are good for. And the, the thing is, I mean, then someone else is dealing with, with what we're, we're able to important stuff, which is really, I mean, how can we help the coagulation? Why doesn't it stop? And there we work together hand in hand, Every, people like you and people like me trying to find a way of doing it. I mean, it's very hard to use clever 
drugs and, and, and uh, anti-foliation uh, therapy when you have a big hole. Uh, you have to address them and try to make them to small holes and maybe to stop them. And then we can help the correlation system continue. And there we have to work together. It's not uh, you or me really, but I, mean, I can't say that in most of these kind of pelvic bleedings, it's not surgical. There's someone else doing it. Maybe radiology. They do more than we do. Hi, and thanks for the uh, interesting lecture. Uh, greetings from Finland, just next George to you. Um, uh, so I got to ask the Reboa question then. Uh, <laughs> a big believer or not? I'm not a believer. Um, I can see the point. I can also see the point long transportation time. When it comes to a, a fast decision to stop a bleeding, the left side is thoracotomy and compressing the, uh, the aorta goes much faster. Uh, of course, you have the different tools. Is this, this blood in the abdomen or not? You're trying to do ultrasound, knowing which level. All knowing that ultrasound is a bad method and knowing if there is bleeding in, in, the, in the abdomen or not. So therefore, it's we kind of, the, um, Reboa is a good method and it's really, I mean, it's all sponsored by the industry and, and very clever chaps who have a very strong, strong mind. And, and I can see the point really. The problem is really the, the decision making where they put the balloon. And uh, so, Therefore, and it's not really me deciding that, it's the, the vascular surgeons in that department. They are kind of <laughs> holding the, the, the flag there. And, and I would say that they, they're against it and they presented to me and I agree with them really that I can't, in, in our hospital it hasn't functioned. I know it's used a lot and maybe not that, that, that much and, at all. I'd say that the <coughs> counterpoint to that with, with Rebo is that I think we, and certainly in London in the, our pre-hospital practice are finding that Rebo is much more useful not for stopping the bleeding, but for repressurizing the aortic route, um, which is something my colleagues will talk about this evening. But I think it's, I think Rebo might be used inappropriately sometimes, and, and I think that's where it's not, it's not its primary thing to stop the bleed. It's actually to buy you time to, to repressurize the route with the amount of blood products you have. Um, our final question. Um, Going, going back to the pelvic binder, uh, I, I think what we do have good data on is that placement of pelvic binders is usually too high. Uh, pre, pre a lot of observational study. But actually it might turn out to be a good thing just from the data that you showed. Uh, because if you, if you say, uh, well, it doesn't help to, to compress the bleeding in the, in the pelvis, but 53% of the bleeding is in the gluteal muscles, then having the binder compress the gluteal muscles might actually be a clever thing. So should we, should we switch to the gluteal muscle compressor instead. Yeah, I agree with that. The interesting thing is I had that dispute with a general surgeon that also who was kind of lead and trauma surgeon and I was kind of junior and, and fighting against the, the, the pelvic sling. Uh, and he put it on and I said, take it off. And he put it on, I said, take it off. And then he said, well, look, I, it helped. And then it was actually what you said. I mean, it didn't help the pelvis, but it was kind of a, a, a little artery which was superficially was bleeding and it was kind of putting a kind of pressure uh, binding uh, on top of that. So I mean, that might be the reason for doing it. Um, so maybe we advocate that then, put it on the wrong place and then see what happens. <laughs> oh, look, I'm gonna thank you so much. It's a fantastic <laughs> talk. And um, I just wanna say that this is exactly the sort of debate that this conference thrives off of. And, and I hope these conversations continue uh, well into the evening and beyond. Um, so our next speaker is someone that needs very little introduction. If you haven't heard of him, you're probably not working in medicine, I'd guess. Um, but Richard Levitan, um, he describes himself as an airway enthusiast and not an expert. I, I think some of us may disagree with that. Um, but he's, he also says he was a recurring consultologist, which, a oh, recovering, sorry, recovering consultologist. And having worked 25 years in, in large centers like New York and Philadelphia, He's now moved to rural practice, um, but and, and also still still with the U.S. Navy as a reservist. Indeed. Um, and uh, developing airway tools and equipment. And he's going to talk to us today about the emergency airway and, and priority. Thank you. I wasn't sure what to do on this talk um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, yesterday at the workshop, people were asking me about these crike sheets and about this military training uh, channel video. It's, it's the world's greatest airway video. Um, if you go to airwaycam.com and you look under the far right corner, there's a little tab and you can pull down the videos. It's uh, an enormously long video with amazing stuff. Um, 
but really cool. So uh, I'll send you there. And there's also a uh, practice sheet uh, for cricothyrotomy that is the size of a human head. You can practice it with a pen, just go through the motions. But people were asking about that at the workshop. So um, this lecture, in order to sort of keep with the theme here of questioning everything, abandoning difficult airway algorithms to improve patient safety. Um, you know, I was taught in medicine uh, when I started, the smarter you are, the better, the better you will do. The more you practice, the better you will be. Um, and that, don't worry, you will get comfortable. More time. Okay, so the smarter, the smarter you are, the better you will do. The more you know, the better you'll be. If you practice again and again, you'll get better. I have come to believe that actually, if we practice wrong, doing it again and again doesn't help. And that actually nobody really cares what you know. What they wanna know is what you can do when it really counts. Um, if you haven't read this book, this is an amazing book. Uh, it is about the impact of the highly improbable. So when you look at events like 9-11 and the world change, people look back on it and say, oh, well, you know, these guys were training to fly planes into buildings. We should have seen this coming. Um, but what we do with these black swan events, they are unpredictable, they carry massive impact, and after the fact, we make up explanations for why they occurred. Um, as it turns out, we are not very good at predicting things. We overpredict our ability to predict. And this applies not only in macro, you know, global, national, uh, but also just in our personal lives. We think, you know, we're gonna have this predictable life of what we're planning to do with ourselves. And then, you know, your child dies, or you get cancer, or you have a full-on STEMI, uh, or some event occurs. Um, yeah, so this, this notion about prediction, I, I think we, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work in my opinion. And what we've been teaching on the airway side is the more algorithms, the better you are, you know, the more you memorize, prediction of difficulty, and especially in America, get a bigger cart. Um, <laughs> in America, we let the companies sell us, you know, all the equipment, and we think if you just fill it with everything, that it will get safer. And then what happens when the operator fails is the institution basically takes out the operator and blames them and says, hey, you had all the equipment. Um, but there are systems issues here. You know, it's fascinating. Think about the fact that in the United States, 350 million people, 5,000 plus hospitals, there's no two hospitals that have the same airway cart. Mayo actually set about to standardize it. But think about that, that we're physicians going to these different facilities, and the toy selection in every place is different. Um, you know, in the U.S., where we have 110 or so nuclear plants, not two of them are identical. In France, 41 nukes, they are all identical. They, like, train to make them identical. They built them identical, and they train people to work on them. But it, it's an interesting phenomenon about this concept of carts and devices. Awake is always safer, is what we were taught. And actually, I think the whole system and how it fails is about complex systems, human factors, but it's also about poor engineering. So let's go back to the difficult airway algorithm 30 years ago. 1993, I was working at Bellevue Hospital. We get a phone call that the World Trade Center has been bombed. And in our ER, which had, I don't know, 80 beds, 100 beds, we empty out the ER. We call upstairs and we say, you're getting five patients. Their diagnoses are on the chart. And boom, they went. And we cleared out. Uh, and 500 people came in covered in soot from head to toe. You couldn't even tell their skin color. You could only see their eyes, basically. But they were all covered in soot. And uh, anyway, that was 1993, and um, obviously different experience with 9-11. But um, 25 million cell phones, now 6.8 billion. Uh, Mandela and Leclerc win the Nobel Prize. Uh, you know, it's interesting that propofol didn't come around to 2001. So, but 1993, 30 years ago, a long time ago, and we came up, you know, the ASA put this out. So, what did we have at our disposal then in terms of, or use? We could do DL, we could do fiber optics, and remember back then it wasn't digital, 
had to be connected to these massive heavy light sources. Um, there were no carts, there were no endoscopy in eMERGE, it didn't exist. There were very few even in ORs. Um, they existed, but you know, not common. Well, laryngeal mask airway, a guy named Dr. Brain, and think about that, and Dr. Brain invents the laryngeal mask airway. Um, I got to meet Archie Brain in 93. He invited me, he was like, I, I got to meet him, there was eight of us, and he invited some people whose articles he'd seen about this new device, and I, I like scratched my head and I totally didn't understand it. Um, but uh, yeah, the LMA was just coming into existence. Now the LMA is, what, 80, 90 plus percent of elective anesthesia. But uh, yeah, needle crites and jet vents, and, and you know, but go through this algorithm, and there's some really interesting things here. Fail, awake intubation, succeed or fail, you fail. Cancel the case, invasive airway. But I like this call for help. Call for help is not a plan. <laughs> like that's not, that's not, a, that's not a, a thing. Like call for help, like I, I don't know. Yes, you should obviously be humble and sure, it may help to have other hands, but this idea that like, I, I don't know, I think this whole business of going down these rigid algorithms, you know, if, if it's six point type, if you have to squint to read it, it is an algorithm you should not trust in my <laughs> mind. Um, there is a guy named Steve Yentis, and some of you in anesthesia may know him, a really bright guy, really sharp guy. And he came up with the Yentis easy to intubate score called the Yeti score. Everyone is given a score of one, which means they're easy to intubate. And if incidence of difficult intubation is one to 2%, then the Yeti score correctly predicts easy intubation in 100% of easy cases. And it is also correct in 98 to 99% of all cases. It's the best predictive airway tool there is. Um, but you know, this happens because we have so many easy intubations, we have very few hard, and the number of predicted hard, you know, that actually turn out to be easy dwarfs the number of true positive. So the poor predictive value, I mean the true, the positive predictive value is very core of this. So yeah, I like the Yeti score. But, um, and where do you draw the line? What counts as, quote, difficult? I got to meet Ronnie Cormack, Cormack and Lehane score, and I asked about how many times they had epiglottis only V. You know, and it was like one or two in a thousand of you couldn't find, not, not epiglottis only, but you couldn't find the epiglottis. So think about that. One in two in a thousand, you can't find the epiglottis. Now we live in an age of video laryngoscopy. Like, it, it's just, it, but where do you draw the line with all these things? If you had to bring out the bougie, is that a difficult airway? If it fails, but then you get it through endoscopy, is that difficult? Uh, video, anyway, do you go at hypoxic injury? When trying to predict a rare outcome, yeah, these positive predictive values are poor, and we don't really have a hard endpoint about what this means, and then what you should do with it. And so, Dr. Yentis says, I dare to suggest that attempting to predict difficult intubation is unlikely to be useful. Does it mean we shouldn't do it? And he says no, because it's gonna at least get you thinking about the airway. What we must do is dispel the myth that it actually helps. And I think that that's a, a very you know, important point. Um, it, it may be difficult, but the real thing is it's probably not gonna be, but what are you gonna do if it is? And, and that brings us to kind of, you know, uh, Michael was doing his 15 second assessment yesterday and his own colleagues uh, in Denmark and I, I don't know, is Michael in the room? He's skiing, good on him. Um, <laughs> but, so, but look at this, this comes out of Denmark. It's a small sample, 188,000 patients. 188,000 and 93% uh, of difficult intubation unanticipated. 94% of difficult mask unanticipated. All they did was ask the anesthesiologist, hey, do you think this is gonna be difficult? And then they followed how many attempts and if it was difficult. And yeah, it turns out not very good. Um, so, and now we have this whole business, this realization that physiologic difficulty is way more common than anatomic difficulty. It's true that video can get us around the corner, but when you start having distorted anatomy in two planes, then an endoscope may help 
Occasionally, surgical airways are necessary. When is that? Distorted anatomy and rapid clinical deterioration. You know, there's a reason on the battlefield why surgical airways are done early. And, uh, you know, when you start having face blasts, when you start having blood, a lot of the things that you're going to use are not going to work. Um, but uh, physiologic difficult airways, 40% risk of peri-intubation, hypoxia, hypotension, and cardiac arrest in critically ill people. That's an enormous number. And that number dwarfs the number of cannot intubate uh, cases. So difficult airways don't change our plan, in my mind, when people are dying. We're still running. We're still running at them. Um, screening can't be applied to the majority of cases, and I showed this back years ago. Uh, zero out of three of our failures out of 850 could even follow simple commands like mountain potty score, arrange their napkin, do other things. And when applied, as I mentioned, that study was very poor. So, and what's the relevance of this now in an era of VL, superglottics, better oxygenation techniques? You know, it blew me away watching Anil Patel's presentation recently of taking somebody who comes into him who's talking like this, <gasps> I've been having trouble <sighs> and I'm supposed to get a drink <sighs> because I have this mass <sighs> on my vocal cords and my breathing. <sighs> my family says it's getting way worse. <sighs> and Anil Patel takes these patients, puts them on Thrive, gives them propofol followed by rocuronium and they have Strider at rest. Like, uh, the world has changed in terms of oxygenation and how we're approaching the airway on so many levels. Um, but, you know, getting back to this business of video, um, I don't know if there's anybody in the group who did this work, uh, but, you know, there's a high prediction of difficulty and high presence of initial poor laryngoscopies, but their overall success rates in this group ended up creating an overall success rate pre-hospital of 99 plus percent. It's very impressive. So anyway, this whole business of uh, trying to predict, I don't think works. But the other reality is, what if it is going to be difficult? Is it easier to do it awake? I would argue no. I would say awake techniques are even harder. And when you start doing drug assisted or delayed sequence, everything has risk. What I have come to appreciate working in critical access hospitals in the middle of nowhere where it's me and two nurses is there is no zero risk. If I don't manage that airway and I put them in the ambulance and it's 90 miles to the trauma center, that's a risk. If I manage the challenging airway by myself with two nurses, yeah, that's a risk. But I am sure not going to dump this on the medic in the back of a moving rig. You know, but there are, there are no zero risks in the emergency game when people are really sick. So uh, pre-SR, pre-RSI checks. So we should assess the mouth. We should check the neck. I would say we should always be ready for the surgical airway. Assess voice if possible. This is a huge thing. You know, the larynx basically is food, breath, and voice, right? So if you can't swallow, if you're drooling, if you have dysphonia or strider, that should be a big red flag. But you still may have to act they may not be a candidate for awake endoscopy, or it may not be appropriate. But the priorities are uh, oxygenation, resuscitation, centric intubation, and avoidance of aspiration. You know, uh, Sackles has done some great work showing how increased attempts um, cause bad things. So what does that mean? What that means is we should bring to the table our best efforts, our entire array on the first go. We shouldn't sit there saying, oh, we can try to predict difficulty, and if necessary, then we're going to bring in, you know, let's say, a video laryngoscope, or we should then bring in an endoscope to go with the video laryngoscope. If I'm pushing drugs in the middle of nowhere, and the person's critically ill, and the airway's high risk, within five feet should be a flexible endoscope to go with my video laryngoscope. Within five feet should be a bougie. Within you know, my pocket is a scalpel. Like, you just have everything ready to go. This notion that somehow we're going to try to predict risk and then do something different, I think we live in a world now of zero acceptable risk. You know, in the States these days, there's bad weather. Southwest warns you and says they may cancel your flight or you may get rebooked. We have reduced risk a lot. And I think acceptable risk now should be very low 
But what I mean by that is we should prepare for possible difficult airways um, in all airways, and especially the critically ill. And uh, Jared Moser has run some great papers on this. But predicting difficulty is much less important than knowing what it is or knowing what to do when it's encountered, namely have a plan. Have a plan for the epiglottis only view, have a plan for tube delivery difficulties, have immediate surgical airway ready to go or at least mentally ready to go and equipment wise ready to go. Um, you know, this whole Elaine Bromley case, um, amazing. And I got to meet Martin Bromley and this is almost 20 My years on. My name's Martin Bromley. And, uh, I'm dad to two young children, Victoria. You know, I wonder what was the take home point of this? And this is the story. What I gathered was we should communicate better. Wife, we should listen to each other. That people realize something was going on. But really, obviously, this is human factors failure. It's crisis performance I'm an failure. With a and why did that happen? Factors. These I want to make clinicians a were not I want to be able untrained. To to they were experienced. They had 10, 15 plus in years. In a few years' time. They had gone to difficult airway courses. Died, they had gone to be the trained. The lessons from that have been learned. But uh, anyway, it and didn't go well. There needs a change and, in practice. You know, there's an interesting in healthcare thing in the here, which uh, comes up in a moment here, where he explains it was just a routine surgery. She was going to go in sinus surgery. And then they got a call from the ENT consultant that when they put Elaine, Elaine to sleep, her airway collapsed. Sinus problems it's a, it's an interesting result, line. A uh, consultant had recommended that she should have routine sinus surgery. She left at 8.30 in the morning, mum kissed mum goodbye, and went off to the Eden food shop. I got a phone call at uh, about 11 o'clock that morning from the EMT consultant, and they explained to me that when Elaine had been anaesthetised, her airway had collapsed. What? what? What is that? <laughs> like, I, I don't know. Her trachea didn't collapse. It's got tracheal rings. Her larynx didn't collapse. It's stented open by the shape of the larynx. What collapsed was her upper airway. Why did it collapse? Because she's laying flat on her back. Why are we doing airway management flat on the back? Because the surgeons want to do something with them flat on their back. <laughs> you know, like, it's a very interesting phenomenon that she survived sleeping for 34 years. She survived physiologically pushing out two kids one of the greatest challenges of human physiology, right? That didn't kill her, no. A combination of propofol, followed by succinylcholine, followed by attempts at intubation. But what happened was, you know, they, they kept doing the same thing over and over. We know that two You know, what in aviation is called a goofy loop, right? So we now know that she was this is nuts. This like, we shouldn't do the same blue. thing over and over and expect a different outcome. But Within four minutes, nobody wanted to cut the lady's neck because this is an elective anesthesia case. You have ENT surgeons there, There's some and they wanted to play the with endoscopes. Time, but we know that six to so eight this is about crisis performance. Happen. This is about the how we conceptualize problems, but it's also about engineering. I would, argue, I would argue that this was not engineered correctly, that if, if Elaine Bromley had been set up water shoot off the mandible. You just distract the mandible. You put O's up the nose. You take that 50 cent nasal cannula and you just go Shh. She'd be alive. You know, in, in this day and age, right, what would we do with her? We'd sit her up, put Thrive on her, and she'd be fine. But trying to bag her after we've taken 60% of her lung volume out, she was, within two minutes, she desaturated because she wasn't pre-oxygenated because they didn't think it was high risk. You know, every case I take, I have O's on. There is O's on the nose before anything else. And then, if they're really bad, I'm putting on BiPAP with PEEP, and I'm you know, doing positive pressure PEEP and nasal oxygen and APOX. But you know, we need to practice in a way that we maximize safety, not this notion that somehow we can predict what's going to be easy and then do only you know, everything on the hard ones. But Anyway, perceived demand versus perceived ability equals stress. When you feel like you can't meet that demand, you get stressed out, your heart rate goes, performance goes, you actually get into this critical zone where things go south. And you know, there's uh, an amazing book called On Combat and On Killing about this, about what happens with heart rate performance. So above 115 beats a minute, you start shaking. 120 to 145, evident tremor, gross motor skills deteriorate. And then above 175, we're talking code brown. Um, you know, <laughs> truly, 
people lose their bowels. You know, this is not a joke. In, in, in combat, this is a common occurrence. Um, but we have to control how we think. Our performance in the moment is a reflection of our self-control of our mind, but also an engineered best practice. You know, uh, Matt, I think, is our PJ, right? Matt, are you in the audience? Spencer, sorry. Um, I have a friend who is a PJ, and he came to my house, and I live on 65 acres in the mountains, and I don't know much about weapons, but I had to qualify on the M18. But anyway, this fellow comes to my house, and he had spent six years as a PJ. And he told me that he was putting 5,000 rounds down range every week, close quarters combat training. But think about that, 5,000 rounds in a week. Um, that, that is some serious practice. But every movement of the hands that he did had been honed. When you look at that cardiovascular surgeon who's doing their task well, every movement has been honed. We need to have, for direct laryngoscopy, for video laryngoscopy, um, you know, for epiglottis only use, for Christ, for oxygenation, we need to have engineered a practice that actually works. And that requires procedural insight, an understanding of safety, risk, and human factors. So, you know, how we think about things, and nobody ever taught me about self-talk, but these are important things. And um, I think the priorities in the airway are oxygenation, hemodynamic st stability, and avoiding aspiration. This notion that you should memorize which box to go down, I think, is flawed. Complexity is fraud. In true crisis, complexity fails, and keeping it simple is important. So what I have found the best clinicians do they don't worry about the big picture. The big picture is too depressing. They work on one step at a time. You get that 700 pound man who rolls into your ER and the medics say he can't breathe, doc, and the pulse ox is 60. You know, you look at that and you could get a little freaked. Um, and what I see is a large man who got that way taking large boluses of food in his upper aero digestive tract. So what that means is there is a path. Um, <laughs> but, but the first step, the first step is opening the airway. You can't do that. You can't drive peep into this man. No, you got to crank him up, water ski off the mandible, add peep, add O's up the nose. But you fix one thing at a time. So you fix the oxygenation, then you get ready for the intubation. But anyway, what I found the best clinicians do is they do one step at a time. Um, yeah, so here's me after intubating this guy who I thought I was going to kill. But um, anyway. Self-talk for enhanced performance under pressure. This comes from a guy named Mike Askin. But I didn't realize this, that nobody ever taught me that I have to control how I think. And I went into a lot of emergency cases for the early part of my career going, oh crap, oh crap, oh, my, 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 my. And it wasn't good. Now what I say to myself as these challenging cases come in, I'm prepared for the challenge. I've spent a lot of time training. My teachers are here with me. I think about Michael Christensen. I think about Jim DeCanto. I think about Paul Baker. I think about Archie Brain. I think about Jack Pacey. I think about an, um, Muhammad Nasir invented the idea. I think about all these people I've gotten to meet over the years, and every one of them are with me when I'm taking care of these patients' airways. I'm, at, I'm all in, as the pilots say. The, you know, the pilots hit the ground first, so they're, they're committed. Um, but, and then it's one step at a time. I think it is a myth that we confront fear, we overcome it through insight, self-control, and engineer best practice. Um, Michael mentioned something about the Canadian Airway Guidelines. This is it, but when you, you know, distill it down, and Adam Law is a wonderful man, you know, as the Aussies would say, he's gorgeous. He's, he's a great guy, uh, if you don't know Adam. But um, anyway, it says here, if case must proceed in an emergency, double setup. So, you know, you can predict all you want, but in true emergency, if the case must proceed, we're pushing drugs. And that's what we do in <coughs> most cases of trauma, pre-hospital, and, and everything else. But along with that, you better have a plan. And you better have incrementalized what you're going to do for, um, you know, an epiglottis-only view. Um, and obviously the oxygenation piece. But I, I just think these uh, Canadian guidelines are the the best if we're going to go down the guideline, but it is interesting. In true emergency, proceed, be ready to cut. And I, I think that's kind of an elegant uh, approach to uh, the trauma airway. So every airway may be difficult, 
with an arm's reach, we should have the full array of gear, not just somewhere in another room, call for help when the difficult airway encounters. But uh, we need to be honest about skills and predictions and incrementalize everything. Um, I suture a lot of faces in the emergency department. I do a ton of plastics works because it's you know, two hours to the nearest place. I get these little kids who come in with vermilion border lax, and I work with loops. If you're an emergency doc doing facial repairs without loops, that's not really engineering your practice. You know, if you're, I, I think about every aspect of my practice now, and I engineer it to make it easier. What I believe the best clinicians do is they simplify their practice, but they also examine it, and they make it stepwise so that they can do better. Uh, it's not that they are better than other clinicians. They've kind of simplified things and made their practice, engineered it better. So oxygenation, obviously, a plan for laryngoscopy, plans for endoscopy, especially through a superglottic and the crike, but self-talk for enhanced performance under pressure. Um, I want to do a, whoops, let me go back, a shout out to uh, TBS for inviting me back. It is very much improving my beauty to death ratio, and I'm so happy to be here. And this guy is named Potato, and uh, yeah, um, you know, all right. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. A, a fantastic talk. Um, I think in light of what you said, I'm, I'm probably going to revisit my own internal dialogue because usually as we're just coming into land, I think what I say to myself is, John, don't fuck up. But I should probably go See, into but a bit I can more detail. Tell you that. No, but, but, but where, I'm sorry, our PJ. Like, where, where's our PJ here? Spencer. Spencer, yeah. Uh, Spencer, are you around? Yeah, so, I mean, but, like, I'm, I'm curious, like, how much in your training is about controlling how you think to deal with the tasks in front of you? No, I think, uh, I think the, whole, the whole process. There about, you go. Yeah, so everything that you're saying, though, as far as setting yourself up for success, you know, that's drained into, I think, everybody in a professional setting, but especially us. Um, if that's what you're getting at. But yeah, yeah, no, I think that it, it's fascinating that in other areas of life and death, like people train for this. Certainly, you know, every area of sport, you think about the mental training that is given to these athletes, these elite athletes. It's the same thing. You know, you're not saying, you know, I think in the States, because we're so worried about med mal, we get into this, you know, oh, what if I screw it up? But I think all these algorithms, they just add to that. Um, but anyway. No, 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 to be honest, I mean, what I do is, um, what I, I, when I have time, I do dry runs in my head of all the critical procedures, so I know what I would want to do in that situation, so I sort of create a motor program, and then when it comes to a thing, I can not focus on that, because I've already worked that through in my head, mm. and then the focus can be on managing the actual environment that I'm in. Yeah. Uh, but, but you know, there, um, Alex Hanold, who you guys know, who did, you know, Free Solo, he climbed El Cap over a hundred times before he actually flashed it and you know did it free solo. He took certain parts of El Cap and did them 60, 70, 80 times, the same part again and again and again with a rope before he actually did it. You know, and what he said was basically that I practiced it again and again until I had no more fear about it. You know, there's behind the scenes, an hour and a half every day, he did finger pull-ups. Think about that. For 10 years, he's doing finger pull-ups on each of his digits for 10 years, an hour and a half a day. Yeah, there's an investment there. <laughs> Question up here at the front. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm an A&E doc in training. And I'm really, I'm really like excited to hear you talk about self-talk and how you can control your own physiology to allow you to perform. And there's a couple of things I've come across that are really useful. Um, box breathing, I think they teach that in the military as well. Yeah. And I think um, visualization, especially for difficult procedures, which I think is kind of what you're talking about with dry runs. Are you aware of any other techniques that you can learn? Um, I, I you know, use the term incrementalization but I think that you gotta believe in your brain that you can do something. You gotta believe it, you gotta 
win in your head before you can win with your hands. So you want to take every procedure you have and make it into the tiniest little steps. And I have seen this, you know, incrementalization when it comes to a variety of military uh, things. But I think it applies, certainly, you see it, you know, in surgical stuff. But, you know, people say, for instance, perform direct laryngoscopy or perform laryngoscopy. If that fails, go to LMA. Like, you know, I could list a hundred things with a laryngoscope. Like, how incremental am I talking? How you pick up the laryngoscope? You pick it up with two fingers. You're picking it up with two fingers, so you're disabling your ability to grab it like this and smush it into the tongue because the errors that people make are they over-engage the tongue, which is not good in social media or in laryngoscopy. <laughs> but, you know, you want to pick it up with two fingers. You want to stay dead med midline and go uvula point epiglottis. So I am sitting there in my head going, uvula point epiglottis. So as it's going down, I'm saying, you know, like you're, you know, box breathing, breathing through your nose, but I'm also kind of running this narrative in my head, but I deliberately do things like disable my grip so I don't over grip and over insert, which is the error that most people make. But I, so to answer your question, we need to incrementalize things down to these tiny little levels. And that's what happens in these life and death operations, uh, you know, where there's no opportunity for error. Yeah. Any other questions? I can't see any, any hands up there. Well, thank you very, very Cheers. much. I was incredibly informed. <laughs> now, I know there are always rivalries between different branches of the military, and you were U.S. Navy. Our next speaker is actually U.S. Air Force. So I, I don't know. I don't know if there's going to be a, you know, a, a little fist fight breaking out later on or not. Maybe. But, um, <laughs> um, but I, I do think she probably outranks um, everyone. <laughs> Um, so our next speaker is Stacy, Stacy Shackelford. She's a colonel in the US Air Force, and she's oh. the former chief of the defense um, services and the joint trauma services. And she's now the trauma director of an entire region. Um, and so I think a huge amount of experience. And as someone described her, said she might walk slightly one-sided because of the amount of medals and awards that she's received. So I won't go to all of those, but I'll just say I think this is someone uniquely qualified. And she's going to talk to us about the timeline of, um, of interventions and, and a bit about transfusions as well. Okay, right on, thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation to this awesome conference and uh, all the awesome people I've met since I've been here. So uh, this is a little bit about the military experience and how we came to appreciate the timeline of life-saving interventions and really the evolution of pre-hospital transfusion, which is an illustration of our approach to problem-solving medical problems in the military. I do have to uh, report my disclaimer that I do not speak on behalf of the Department of Defense, only myself. I have no conflicts of interest, but admittedly, I do have an interest in conflicts. <laughs> so, uh, actually, let me just see a raise of hand. How many of you in this room work in a pre-hospital environment? Okay, awesome, maybe over half the room. How many of you work in the hospital, but you hate it when your patients show up dead or in cardiac arrest? <laughs> Sweet, okay, that's everybody else. Are there any trauma surgeons in the room that just really like to do emergency thoracotomies and CPR? I mean, I kind of like to do that too, but <laughs> usually it's futile. Okay, so uh, really starting off in about 2012 timeframe, this paper was published. And it really looked at the fatalities in the US military uh, for the first 10 years of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And we looked at, uh, two papers were published, one on MTF, which is Military Treatment Facility, those are hospitals, hospital deaths and pre-hospital deaths. And we found that 90% of deaths occur in the pre-hospital environment. 
And to me at the time, this was like the first eye opener. I was like, what? I'm working here in a hospital. I'm doing like, you know, like advanced resuscitation, brain surgery, limb salvage, like working day and night. And 90% of the patients don't even get a chance. And I was just blown away by this. They didn't teach me this in my residency. Um, and the red sections there highlighted uh, was reviewing all the autopsies of uh, approximately 5,000 deaths. We found that roughly a quarter of the pre-hospital deaths were designated as potentially preventable, just on their injury pattern alone, not the clinical circumstances. And about half of the in-hospital deaths were potentially survivable injuries. And this really made us think, like, how can we fix this problem and bring more resources to the pre-hospital environment? Drilling down even further, we tried to figure out how many, or what was the cause of those deaths. And on the top here, you see pre-hospital deaths, 24% potentially survivable, and like 91% of them were caused by hemorrhage. A few by airway, a few by tension pneumothorax, but really the elephant in the room is the vast majority of pre-hospital potentially survivable fatalities were associated with hemorrhage. In the hospital, it's still like 80%, like the majority of in-hospital deaths also occur from hemorrhage. So really started uh, aggressively trying to look at how can we fix this? How can we better stop bleeding in the pre-hospital environment? How can we better resuscitate in the pre-hospital environment? Around that time, 2012, we started trying to bring blood transfusions to the Army medevac. Now, admittedly, the year before this, the Air Force had pararescuemen in Afghanistan flying medevac missions, and they had already figured this out. Uh, but there are much higher trained medics in the, on the pararescue guys. These guys dust off. Uh, dust off stands for dedicated, unhesitating service to our fighting forces. This is our medevac. Uh, these guys were trained in the year 2012 to the level of EMT basic. And we're like, how do we teach these guys how to transfuse blood? And we started a big program going around nurses, adding some nurses to the medevacs, teaching them how to transfuse blood. Uh, in addition, around the same year, uh, the technology improved for these blood storage containers. We were able to actually um, logistically get the blood out onto the helicopters in the middle of the desert, keep it cool. And they started what we call the vampire mission, which uh, meant that we get a patient who met criteria for blood transfusion. We call this a vampire mission, and uh, they get blood. A uh, couple years later, um, we actually changed the tactical combat casualty care guidelines. These are the pre-hospital guidelines for trauma care in the military. And uh, you can see here, this is a big change. Whole blood, first choice, pre-hospital transfusion, followed by any combination of any blood product. And then lastly, well, if you don't have any blood products, you can consider Hextend or Crystalloid. And then a few years later, we decided to screw that. We're not even going with any non-blood product. We're just going to go with blood products. Um, and so, and again, uh, this is in the setting in the U.S. military. We have very little access to freeze-dried plasma, uh, but you can imagine that might be on the list if we had access to it. Um, and, you know, I remember I was actually at this TC3 meeting when we discussed this, and there were some naysayers in the room, uh, like there's no way that people are gonna be able to deliver whole blood in the pre-hospital environment, you know, outside of a helicopter. And, um, and the other people in the room said, well, this is the right thing to do. This is gonna be the best uh, survival for the patient. So we're just gonna recommend this and see what happens. And it wasn't even a year later when these guys, 75th Ranger Regiment, got with some weirdos from Norway at the Thor meeting and they were like, yeah, we can do this. And they figured out how to uh, draw blood from their colleagues in their, you know, their brothers in arms in combat and uh, transfuse it. And they basically drilled this to where they got it down to within less than 15 minutes to draw and transfuse blood in combat. 
not an easy thing. Uh, this is actually a training exercise, but you can see here, here's a casualty. You got like bilateral amputations, bleeding control with tourniquets, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, here's a uh, simulated unit of blood medics trying to, you know, uh, get that transfused uh, amongst all the chaos and potentially under night vision goggles. So not an easy task. Over time, uh, we got um, our uh, rangers actually were able to request and get access to cold stored whole blood. And this was the beginning of sort of like us uh, transitioning to cold stored, low titer, whole blood, fully uh, transfusion, transmittable disease tested. Um, it was shipped from the US to these austere locations, uh, got there in time. Um, we initially started out using CPD. Uh, storage solution, uh, which lasts for about 21 days. And then if you uh, use CBD Alpha-1, this gets it up to 35 days, which is pretty close to the storage life of, of uh, just packed red blood cells. Um, initially, we used this in the pre-hospital environment, and then gradually it became our fluid resuscitation of choice in the hospital environment. And you can see this has all progressed without a lot of uh, actual data. Um, just the data on pre-hospital deaths, bleeding, this is a problem. One of our biggest challenges was convincing our blood bank. So Armed Services Blood Program is our uh, blood bankers, and they have donor centers around the country and overseas. And you basically, these guys basically collect the blood and divide it up into fraction, fractionated into components and then give it to us. And we're like, well, all you have to do is quit fractionating it and we'll have a lot of whole blood that we can use to transfuse. Well, it turns out it wasn't as simple, and it was a lot of inertia in the blood bank program that we had to work against. And I don't fully understand why, but just the having two different storage solutions just freaked them out. You know, we have to put some blood for the components in CPD. We have to put the whole blood in CPD alpha, and it just blew their minds and was really, really hard. Uh, but you know, with the help of a few uh, blood bankers who are really working closely with the trauma surgeons, they understand the importance of um, getting all three of those components into the casualty in like a low resource intent, you know, a low resource environment where there's not a lot of people to do the task. Even just spiking two or three bags instead of one bag of whole blood is a problem. You know, so gradually, gradually, we started getting more and more whole blood availability, and now we can get it out to all of our surgical teams. Um, so, what are the challenges we faced here? Pre-screening, uh, we like to have fresh whole blood, which is the walking blood bank, um, as our backup plan all the time. So we train it, we train it to our medics, we train it to our medevacs, we train it to our surgical teams, uh, so that you can draw blood from a walking live donor and give that to the patient when you don't have anything else. Uh, this is, um, we call it the nectar of the gods because it's so, such a robust resuscitation fluid and it sort of magically stops bleeding. We can't do this in the States, we can't do this in Europe. I mean, it's like on the civilian side, it's basically like, oh no, this is not allowed by the, you know, the FDA people, but um, we can do it in the military. And um, you know we are working to try to maybe push this capability onto the military side. But pre-screening these folks, um, so there's always a risk because from the time whenever you tested the donor to the time they can actually donate, you know, did they get HIV or hepatitis or whatever they might get exposed to that could be a tr transfusion transmitted disease. So that risk is never zero. It's not as safe as drawing the blood, testing that unit of blood in the blood bank and sending it to you. Managing the donors, really hard. These, those low titer type O donors are a precious resource. Uh, it's about 40% um, of the overall population, so it's a pretty large group of folks, but still important to manage those donors. Uh, I mentioned the problem with the blood bank, figuring out you know, uh, how to manage two different storage solutions, really tough for the blood bank. Training is a perishable skill. Um, you know, you have to have you have to have very organized process to 
find those donors when you need them, get them there, um, draw the blood, uh, and then turn around and transfuse the blood and make sure um, you know that the donor is the either a universal donor, low titer O, or type specific, and it matches. Um, blood warming uh, is a significant problem. Uh, I saw the Quinflow people back there, great. We have these uh, crappy um, things that don't really warm the blood very well. Uh, maybe make it a little less cold. And uh, also pretty expensive. You know, when you talk about equipping all the pre-hospital guys and the medics with blood storage containers and blood warmers, I mean, that's a pretty steep expense. So a lot of our conventional units, uh, not the special operations, have gone to um, just carrying uh, like a, a blood, um, a blood uh, drawing kit so they can draw blood when they need to. Um, these are larger storage containers for the medevac. And then, you know, just the limitations of our like surgical team pack out and uh, surgical team storage uh, multiple different um, locations that you might need to uh, store that. So now I'm going to transition a little bit to talking about how we uh, looked at this data. So we sort of forged forward. Uh, we call it uh, focused empiricism, where we find that what we think is the right answer, we drive with it, and then we sort of retrospectively collect data. Um, now I'm going to tell a little anecdote here. So. I want you to kind of keep this in mind as we talk about trauma data in general and specifically blood transfusion. So this, this was aircraft from World War II, B-41. This guy is named Dr. Wald. He's an epidemiologist who was helping the U.S. Uh, Allied forces in uh, World War II. And you can see this aircraft, obviously not doing too well there. So uh, it, they did an analysis of the... Uh, aircraft that returned to the airfield that had uh, been struck by enemy fire. And they plotted out all the locations on this aircraft where uh, the fire had uh, damaged the aircraft, and we're looking at ways to improve the armor on the aircraft. So where on this aircraft do we need more armor? Well, Dr. Wald figured out, obviously, the wings do not need more armor, nor does the tail, right? It's the fuselage. These are the aircraft that did not return to the airfield, that crashed and burned, and everybody on board died, and they did not return to the airfield. So clearly, uh, that is the area, the fuselage, that needed more armor. Um, so this is what we call survival bias. And uh, this is probably one of the most prevalent problems in the trauma literature. and. Uh, there is a number of studies out there that show that pre-hospital transfusion makes no difference in your survival. Uh, we actually looked at a uh, number of our fatalities, the last 308 between 2007 and 14, uh, where we looked at the autopsies. Now, this is just a small sample of all the mortalities, but we wanted to look at ones that had a very uh, specific survivability assessments. Looking at the autopsies, was that injury survivable or non-survivable? People think that if you exclude the early deaths, the pre-hospital deaths, and sometimes even the first one hour after hospital arrival, you're going to kind of get the people out of the study that had non-survivable injuries. Well, it turns out that there's really no difference in the time. This is the mean time right here uh, for potentially survivable and non-survivable. No difference. Uh, this is also showing, showing it a different way non-survivable in blue and survivable in red. This, and it's over time. This is how many people uh, died. And basically, those two lines are almost parallel. So essentially, if you exclude those early deaths, uh, my statistician likes to say you're throwing out the baby with, with the bathwater. Like, who are you trying to save? It's those people that died in the first hour after they got to the hospital and the ones that died before the hospital, right? Uh, biggest chance of saving more lives. So what's the data? Uh, so this was a publication that came out looking at the association of blood tra product transfusion during medical evacuation of combat casualties. And uh, ultimately, we found that it's really time. It's the time of transfusion that makes the biggest difference. Uh, this is a really unique study because it, as we expanded our capability uh, in Afghanistan one location at a time, 
so as not to you know, do an uncontrolled uh, start of this program. We had locations that were transfusing and not transfusing at the same time. So it's not a before and after study, it's a concurrent study where some sites in Afghanistan were able to transfuse, some were not. And um, in addition, uh, every single mortality was captured. So we don't lose track of our uh, combat soldiers when they're killed in combat. They're included in the study. Every fatality had an autopsy. Um, and we also had in most of the patients, we had the timeline of all of the interventions. And so what did we find? Um, this idea of time to transfusion really, really showed an impact. So uh, 15 minutes within, if the patient received a transfusion, within 15 minutes of the start of medevac, they had a significantly improved survival. And here you can see the probability of death uh, if they got transfused after 15 minutes and before 15 minutes. Okay, well, what about five minutes later? Five minutes later, they got transfused and it literally made no difference. These are the uh, before or within 16 to 20 minutes and after 20 minutes, there was no difference in their survival. Basically, those patients didn't matter if they got a transfusion or not. Uh, and uh, by the way, 15 minutes after medevac rescue averaged uh, well, median of 36 minutes after injury. So we concluded that for those casualties that got transfused within about 36 minutes of the time of injury, uh, had a significantly better survival. And again, this is kind of a planning factor because that's an average time and every individual patient might not have 30 minutes, um, but on average, uh, that's really the target that we try to shoot for. Um, follow on study to that, uh, we started looking at time to surgery. Um, and interestingly, we looked at time to arrival at a surgical location. At the surgical location, they have an advanced resuscitation team. Sure, they can get surgery. They can also get a lot of blood products. And there's really a capability for advanced decision making, diagnostic equipment, experienced clinicians who also had a lot of operational experience. And in this publication, uh, published in January of this year, uh, we looked at uh, about um, patients between 2007 and 2015 uh, from our operations in Iraq, Afghanistan, who were at least moderately injured uh, with a maximum AIS score that was at least two. Uh, we used data from our trauma registry and from our fatality uh, medical examiner database. Um, and this is the survival curves. So we're looking at time. We found that 68% of all deaths occurred within the first one hour. 90% of all deaths occurred within four, th four hours. And then after four hours, remarkably, the curve is pretty gosh darn flat. Uh, and even for 30-day uh, survival, like look at this. <laughs> so like the vast majority of fatalities occur with just within the first day, within really just the first hour after injury. And then after that, if you survive that first one hour and first four hours, your chances of dying are extremely low. Um, time, how did that make a difference? So in the military uh, survival cohort, about 5,000 patients, you can see that um, this is survival curve now. If they arrived at a surgical team within one hour, the survival was uh, significantly better by about 6% compared to those who arrived after one hour. And we looked at different cut points. We tried to look at 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 90 minutes, um, hazard ratio of 0 0.4, which is a really strongly significant. What about half an hour later, 60 to 90 minutes? No difference in survival for those who arrived within 60 to 90 minutes versus later. Uh, so again, another planning factor. If you get to a surgical team uh, within one hour, you do have a significantly better survival. Later than that, really, 
doesn't make a big difference, largely because those casualties with the most severe injuries already died. And the weird, even weirder thing, so looking at the subset of patients who actually required surgery, so it's not every single patient who was handed off to a surgical team had surgery, right? So that subset who required surgery, those patients who were handed off within one hour had a significantly better survival. But the weird thing is, the amount of time they spent in the hospital waiting for surgery made no difference. We always feel like we have to get them to the OR really quickly. Um, but this, the cut point was 1.2 hours, uh, less than 1.2, more than 1.2. This is from the time you arrive at the hospital to the time you actually get surgery. There was no difference in how long you had to wait in your survival. Um, and from this, we concluded that there are some patients that need to get to the OR really fast. There are some patients that can wait. There are uh, some patients who ne just need advanced resuscitation capability and not decision-making capability. And so once you get to the surgical team, you have the ability to basically do whatever the patient needs uh, to save their life. And those who need surgery get to surgery, and those who can wait are triaged to more delayed care, and that does not affect their survival. So this is what we call the timeline of life-saving interventions. Um, we know you need to control massive external bleeding and clear the airway, ensure breathing within probably just a few minutes. Um, we, we target blood transfusion within about 30 minutes, uh, and we target surgical team arrival within one hour. Again, this is a planning factor. Uh, faster is always better, but you know, in general, we uh, plan for that. After about four hours, uh, we call this a prolonged field care, prolonged casualty care, where uh, you, know, you transition to more of a sustainment phase, uh, especially if they haven't arrived to the hospital, you really need to train those uh, prolonged care capabilities to, the, to those uh, lower levels of care and the pre-hospital guys. But if you've survived four hours and you continue to get care, uh, the chances of dying after that are relatively low. Um, and then a topic for the bar, we don't have time to really go into detail on this, but we're super interested in how this applies to mass casualty situations. And uh, we published a paper on this, but you know, time actually, time itself is a triage tool. The risk of dying is higher the sooner after injury, and if you survive longer, the more likely you are to survive. Um, so in that way, those who survive self-triage themselves as having survivable injuries. There's not just one size fits all mass casualty event. There are some many casualties, dozens of casualties, hundreds of thousands of casualties. The larger the event, probably the more delayed the rescuer's team's arrival and the more you rely on those sort of non-medical first responders. You know, can you train the other people on scene to, to uh, stop bleeding and clear the airway? The two really quick interventions. And finally, um, these actions within the golden hour are essential. Um, we know that the sooner after injury, if you don't meet that timeline of life-saving interventions, you're not gonna survive to the next time span. And really, you know, there's some priorities that need to happen. Big casualty event, scene safety. Like you can't get medical care onto the scene uh, without safety, just extricating them from uh, further injury. And then what we call first pass actions, like don't even try to triage people, just stop external bleeding and clear the airway. Those are like the two most important things. If you've done all that, uh, maybe you can uh, proceed to more advanced interventions. But triage, formal triage is just a waste of time during the first hour. You don't need to like go like sorting casualties. You just try to do the most good for the most people. And probably once you've really uh, you know, made those first pass actions, you can then go on to more formal triage decisions, sorting casualties, uh, really, usually after the first one hour, if you even arrive during that time. Uh, that is all I had prepared, and uh, you can see my contact information here if you have any, um, any offline questions that you want, me hit, want to hit me up after the conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, a fantastic talk. And, and I think a lot of people in this room will, will 
empathise and share your pain about trying to get blood products through regulatory channels. And it seems to be something not unique to any one country or any one system, but to, to everybody. <laughs> um, any questions from the audience? Can I see some hands up? Or? Ah, is there a hand up over there? Or? So I had, I had one question. In terms of getting, throwing forward that care into that first, you know, that first 30 minutes or, or so after injury, obviously the, the people that are getting to those patients are not going to be medical specialists. They're not going to be your doctors. They're not going to be your surgeons. You know, and they're, they're probably not even going to be your highest trained EMTs. How do you go about protocolizing and delivering that care to untrained personnel to, to make sure they're getting those critical interventions? Um, so we have this, like there's just a few basic interventions that we train to everybody. Uh, even in the US we have the Stop the Bleed campaign that we try to teach sort of like CPR. We try to teach the general population how to, how to apply direct pressure, uh, put on a tourniquet, um, you know, use the position of comfort to try to clear the airway, lateral position, very, very simple maneuvers uh, that can have a huge impact in terms of the largest causes of mortality. Uh, certainly, you know, more advanced interventions. Uh, in particular, if you can't live one hour without a blood transfusion and you can't live one hour without ventilator support, this is a, almost like a triage thing, like that is a really sick patient. And so depending on the sort of scenario, you may or may not have the resources to handle those really sick patients. So, I mean, there is a little bit of, uh, you know, reality that comes in if you have you know, too remote of an environment or too many casualties at a time, those are not the patients that are gonna survive. But really nobody should die of extremity hemorrhage or compressible hemorrhage uh, uh, externally that you can control with literally a lay person responding. Absolutely, and I think these, um, oh, there's a question up here, but I think these things with um, um, sort of what we call zero responders in the UK, I don't know if that's a term internationally used or not, mm -hmm. certainly in mass like casualty it. events, yeah. actually the person next to you when the bomb goes off or, or, or someone starts shooting is going to be the person that delivers that care to you, not the medical first responder. Yes, I like that term. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I was wondering if, like your picture of the aircraft with all the bits that have been hit, have you done that with people? And how has that affected your sort of... Um, we have. Uh, we people? have done it for our fatalities and for our, uh, for our survivors. And uh, it is interesting because you can see the effects of that we have with our body armor that we wear for reducing the uh, torso hemorrhage. Um, in our uh, casualties, there's a really, really high incidence of limb uh, injuries and... Um, uh, facial injuries, because those are the areas most exposed that have the sort of least protection from the body armor. Um, and and uh, I'm just thinking of penetrating trauma, actually, with that mapping. Um, and so, uh, but yeah, it is pretty interesting. One of your colleagues presenting at one of our London days talking about um, some body armor changes to finding a number of patients um, that had been shot through the back of the, of the head and, and that the body armor wasn't adequate in the helmets. Yeah, and like the lower, the occipital yes, region. Yeah. Uh, we also have like, we've added flank uh, protection, yeah. uh, but it's a trade-off, you know, like, like some of our uh, special operations guys, they gotta like sprint up some hills and they're athletically performing in order to do their mission and like adding more body armor onto them doesn't necessarily, you know, uh, help them. I, I saw some like police in the Zurich airport and they had like, or in the train station, they had like friggin' like armor all the way down their legs and arms. I mean, they look like stormtroopers. I was impressed. <laughs> but they've been upping their armor since, was it 1964, since the last murder? <laughs> so, Fiona, did you have another question? Uh, can I say, in, in fact, you get more junctional hemorrhage as a result of the armor? Uh, so, we have a definitely significant portion of junctional hemorrhage. Um, and when we looked at our potentially survivable injuries, those junctional hemorrhages were categorized as compressible and um, potentially survivable. And they uh, amounted for approximately, so torso hemorrhage was about 60% of fatalities, 
of the potentially survivable a junctional was about 20% and the extremities uh, after the onset of tourniquets was uh, less than 10% of potentially survivable injuries. Um, I think, I don't think you're increasing the junctional hemorrhage, but you're, by, you know, maybe proportionally de by decreasing the torso hemorrhage, you're probably uh, proportionally might have more junctional hemorrhage. Um, but, you know, it's, we still have torsal hemorrhage, even with the body armor, because there's, you know, you can't just like encase the torso, axilla, whatever part. Well, first, a huge congratulations to the quality of the studies uh, that, that you do and present it. I mean, autopsies on all these patients is just, just fantastic. You can't do that in a civilian setting. Yeah. Now, you, you're probably aware of, of the of the civilian trials with pre-hospital blood transfusions, pop, proper and pamper and all these. Sure. And I, I, I think one of the conclusions from there is uh, that, that, that whether or not patients benefit in a civilian setting from pre-hospital transfusions depends on how long it takes to take them to a trauma center. Uh, so that those that are around the corner of, of, uh, of a London hospital, they don't seem to benefit much, whereas if it takes them 20 or minutes or longer, that th they seem to benefit. Is that, I mean, that, that's sort of a different way of looking at your timestamps, right? Is yeah, th did that's exactly what we found. Because those patients, um, it didn't matter whether the transfusion was pre-hospital or in-hospital. And we actually found in our cohort of patients, there were some people that got to the hospital faster than, you know, some of the patients that got transfused on the medevacs. And you know, some people had a pretty delayed evacuation. And some of the people got to the hospital within like 10 minutes. You know, in that time era of Afghanistan, uh, was a really robust number of medevacs. And so you're exactly right. The time from, time from injury to surgery, or time injury to transfusion, it doesn't matter where you are. If you're in the hospital, or on a helicopter, or at the point of injury, it's the time and how much bleeding is going on. So for sure. And that, and that 20 minutes aligns perfectly well with your 15 minutes. Yeah, but uh, those studies, I think, so they didn't report the time of transfusion very well. Uh, and they did kind of come back and say, well, when the transport is longer than whatever number of minutes, then those patients benefited. But um, in America, in the US, the, the helicopter is rarely the first responder. You know, they'll use, typically send a ground ambulance to assess the situation. And once those guys get there, then they'll call the helicopter in if they think you know it's necessary. And uh, so it, it's pretty delayed by the time the helicopters get there. Um, and uh, I think probably after 30 minutes, a lot of those patients did not get transfused within the first 30 minutes. In addition, they definitely don't include the pre-hospital fatalities in their study. And uh, you know, um, a lot of these studies actually exclude the early deaths, even after hospital arrival, which is, you know, we're trying to sort of get that message out there as strongly as we can, but we still see it like almost every day. You know, every life-saving intervention, Reboa, you know, just like, if, it's, if it doesn't make sense, like bleeding patient, give them blood, bleeding patient, stop bleeding, and it doesn't help, like, good chance there's something wrong with the inclusion criteria. Very true. Now, um, thank you so much. Um, so, I'd like you to hold some of the thoughts and questions you've got from the sessions this morning, because I'm, I'm hoping that these conversations will continue over the afternoon and over the little time we have to go skiing, um, because we'll come back to these themes in the evening um, with the second trauma session. But now we're going to take a slight break and a slight segue away from trauma. But I think one of the key things about this room and these people here and, and those listening online at home is that as a community of physicians looking after, uh, sorry, not just physicians, sorry, I should say, as a community of medical staff looking after these patients in their first hours at their most injured, the communication and the cross-pollination of ideas and ethos is between us is absolutely critical. And, and, and one of those things that, that makes those things really important is how we communicate to one another and how we present the stuff that we do. 
So our next speaker, is a, he's a paediatric surgeon um, from Sheffield, but you'll know Ross Fisher much more for his P-Cubed website and the fact that his presentation hacks and his, um, and his way of getting people to present better, which obviously, as I say that, I present it terribly. So I'm going to hand you over to Ross. <laughs> Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, this is a trauma session principally for me because I am a surgeon exposed to many, many anaesthetists, intensivists, and pre-hospital people. I'm stressed, but what I want to tell you is that this presentation is the most important presentation you will ever receive. <laughs> and that's not a joke. Because I firmly believe that education saves lives. Now, whether it's Colonel Shackelford and the wisdom of blood transfusion, whether it's the right ventricular hypertrophy and how we should manage it, if you have taken nothing away from that presentation, then no patients will be saved. If you have life-changing research on how to use um, microscopes to assess patients and you cannot convince people of its value, people will continue to die. Science is not complete until it is effectively communicated. And my sadness is that science is not complete because it is not effectively communicated. And what I want you to do is this is thinking. I am not going to tell you how to do any of this, but what do you think about science of presentations? Because presentations are not a skill. I was not born to do this any more than you were born to intubate patients or born to do pre-hospital. It's about science. What do you think about the science of presentations? Now, I think one of the skills of presentation is what I just did there, is that you just ignored the question at first, but in the silence, you had to then start to consider. And for some of you, you went, there is no science in presentation, which is good because you have an opinion. And for some of you, you said, I don't know what the science says. And some of you said, I am an excellent presenter. I don't care what you think. And that's fine. That's absolutely fine. At least you have an opinion and you thought about it. But if you think about it, what makes a difference in medical care is the way that medical care evolves. And presentations need to evolve beyond what we are doing, not by some massive revolution, because that won't happen, but by slow and incremental changes where you hear and think about science of presentations, and that will make your presentations better, and you will save more lives. So here's a question for you. What do you think learning is? Again, it's going to be one of those silences where you have to think. What do you think learning is? Because what you think learning is affects how you view presentations. It affects how you would construct a presentation if you're going to deliver it. And it also affects what you're doing right now. Do you believe you are learning? Have you been learning through the last two amazing days of presentations? What is learning? The next question is similar, but is education effective? Now that is a challenge because of the amount of effort we put into education and how valuable it is. It is no use if education is not effective. But is the education that you deliver, because most of us are deliverers of education, is that effective? And is the education that you receive effective? Now that's actually yes or no, because once you start to justify that, say, well, no, but, or yes, but, then you are actually going one way or the other. And your justification is important to realize what that means for education. What do you even mean by effective? But here's the thing, if you deliver a talk on rapid sequence induction to a group of 50 trainees, do you now believe that they can walk out that door and deliver rapid sequence induction on the hill, having gone up to ski? Or do you just think you've delivered it? 
Because this question is essential. How do you know your education is effective? It is not simply the delivery of knowledge, because that's what Amazon does. They deliver new books to you. You have received new knowledge. But for most of us, that new knowledge is tsundoku, which is a Japanese word that means the pile of books on the end of your desk that you know you should read and have bought but have not read. So how do you know that your education is effective? And again, these are broad and general questions to which there is no answer, but you should have a thought as to how you know education is effective. What is the purpose of presentations within that? Because something that breaks my heart is when you go to a workshop and somebody says, I'm terribly sorry, we couldn't get the slides to work. That's it. Or somebody says, I've got a great talk to give you, and then they, they fire up their PowerPoint, and every piece of passion, enthusiasm, and wisdom is torpedoed by what happens up here. What is the purpose of a presentation overall? Is it for education? Is it for learning? And is it effective? Do your presentations deliver education? That's a yes or no question. Um, it's dark, nobody can see. I would ask you to put your hands up, but inside, are your presentations effective? Say yes or no, and how do you know? Now, just because they're like everybody else's, and just because someone says at the end of your presentation, thank you very much for your excellent presentation, I very much enjoyed it, that means they worked at McDonald's. That's where they learned that phrase. It is not a review of your presentation and how effective it was. But you delivered education. See what I'm doing by looking here? We're reading together. But you read that out to yourself. How do you know? Do you? Do you really know? Do you get good feedback? Or was your my educational needs met? Now, here's a question I actually want you to vote on. I want you to put your hand up if you believe in science. Now, I can't see the whole audience, but if there's anyone out there who's not got a... Colonel Stacy has not got her hand up. <laughs> okay, now, with respect, ma'am, you are a senior officer, but <laughs> you need to lead by example here. Do we believe in science? Say, yeah. yeah. Now, come on, do you believe in science? Yeah. Amazing speakers have been sharing with you amazing science. You need to believe in that stuff. Here's a question, though. Do you believe in science that challenges what you do? Yes. Can I hit? That's not as loud as the last one, was it? <laughs> yeah, hell yeah. But it's really difficult when some annoying person comes out with a presentation that shows you shouldn't give 40 mils per kilo of normal saline to children in trauma. Because that's what I used to do in 1993. It doesn't work. It's not good for people. The numbers look great, but kids die because you have hemodiluted them. Their clotting goes bad. Their homeostasis goes bad. So stop doing it. But it took... 17 years to change medical practice because knowledge translation is a problem. And it's not just that people don't communicate it effectively, it's that we don't want to change. So the last question I want you to ask it answer is this. Do you believe in science that you haven't read? No. Good. Because there's some reason that we think just because I'm a professor of surgery, I know about everything. Now, I'm good at surgical oncology. I'm pretty good at vascular access. I have no idea about anesthesiology. I have very little idea about buying wine. But you can be sure that many people who are strongly opinionated will tell you they know everything about everything. And when it comes to presentation science, I am tired of people who tell me what they believe, but the science proves them wrong. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is where the rubber hits the road. Science does not care what you believe. COVID was a perfect example of this. Don't believe in vaccination and I don't believe in COVID is something that many people said not long before they died. This is our experience of presentations. I love this slide and I've used it for years. This guy here, he's in the room, he's focused. He's going to get everything from what is happening. This guy here... Let's just say he's taking notes. He's not taking notes. 
And it's a great thing in a presentation. If you just look around, how many people are on their phone? They're not taking notes, people. This guy here has realized that the most effective way of transferring large volumes of knowledge from one person to another is a written document, and he is reading it. This guy here has realized that presentations suck because people put large volumes of information on the slides and then read it out to you. And he has died and joined the Choir Invisible, and people are just jealous. <laughs> Why? Because of science. Now, this is no criticism of any of the previous speakers, particularly to the Colonel, because she can kill me in the dark and nobody will find the body. <laughs> this is not a criticism. This is about every single one of us being better right now at presentations than you were 10 minutes ago. We live in a virtual reality. And I am going to prove that to you. And a bit like the film that this comes from, most of us don't really know. This is medical education. Pi is a number which is 3.141592655. Three, five, eight, nine, seven, nine, three, two, three. You can see me shaking here. Eight, four, six, two, six, four, three, three, eight. Now, is there anyone out there prepared to put their hand up and say they now know pi to more numbers than you did beforehand? Because you don't. But when you read through the 10 bullet points that are on a slide and you read them along with me as I did and you go, yeah, three, two, three, eight, four, six, you have remembered really not very much. The soldiers have not been built like this and trust me, medical students are not built like this either. You do not have a USB bolt in the back of your head where they can plug it in and download cardiac physiology so that after 40 minutes you can go, I know cardiac physiology. How much do you think you remember from a presentation? The science would suggest that in the average 10 minute presentation, there are over 200 individual facts delivered, of which if you work really, really, really hard and exclude all the other ones, you will remember seven. And you won't remember anything else. Or the truth is, most of us can remember three facts from those 200, and most presentations go on for 45 minutes. And that's like remembering one, three, and nine are new numbers from pi. You don't know what order they come in, they're just new, because I like one, three, and nine. It is essential that you understand that the method of delivery of information is not a download like a computer, and also that you are as stupid as a hypnotized chicken. Because at no point did I make any reference to the slide behind me, and most of you chickens are reading it. What I really want to know is which chickens got beyond this bit here that said, please stop reading this. Because you did read that, and you looked the other way. Science shows us that you are stupid. So that if I turn that off, you will focus on me. If I turn that on, you will look at that. If I turn it off, you'll look at me. If I turn it back on, you will look at that. <laughs> Thank you. I've never had applause before, but it's good. <laughs> Watch what happens when I turn this on. <laughs> this is not just fashion. You are as stupid as a hypnotized chicken. <laughs> Whoops, we've gone backwards. Let's go forwards. You're going to see the numbers again. Repetition is good in medical education. How many facts? 200. How many will you remember? Seven. Probably three. I'm screwed because those are the only facts you're going to remember for the rest of the presentation. <laughs> but let's move on to the hypnotized chicken because the hypnotized chicken is you with text. So even though you know that slide's coming up and you shouldn't look at it, you're looking at it. But if I say, don't look at it, this guy here is really focused, it's great. But he's desperate, and I just do that, how much better does it feel? This is not just a joke, this is science. And here is the 93 individual psychological principles that PowerPoint breaks. Not one, not just a bit, not just a few, 
but 93. And here is the chicken about to be hypnotized for your delectation. Nothing bad happens to the chicken. Just a line in the sand. And you stared at the text when I told you not to. I have to play this through because people think the chicken's on drugs or ketamine because that's what everybody seems to use nowadays. But this chicken will get up and walk away. Once it's figured out, there's nothing valuable there. You, however, will look at text straight away because you are as stupid as a chicken. And I can say that because when I go abroad and I don't even speak the language, or worse, the letters aren't the same, I will still stare at text. Chicken gets up, walks away. This, ladies and gentlemen, is what is called cognitive load. This is the science you have not heard about. This is the science you sort of know, but this is the science which shows that bullet points inhibit your learning. Full stop, end of paragraph, end of chapter, they stopped doing research on this 30 years ago. But you didn't know that. You actually did, and that's why you hate bullet points. The second thing which is important is that it's not just the cognitive load, but what's called the dual processing theory. So that if I say the next thing is dual processing and then put dual processing up, that's dual processing. And I've done it twice there because you are stupid. No, seriously, why do you think that adult, intelligent, multiply qualified people need text on the screen to understand the voice that's coming out of here? You put aim at the top and say, here's the aim. And then you read the aim out to people. Seriously, if these people can't read, they shouldn't be in your talk. And you patronize them to the point at which they have to read. Or worse, you say, let's all read it together. It's dual processing. is monumentally patronizing. And you subconsciously know it. I'm sorry. This is science. And this is our experience. This is a research society. These people here have realized it's a waste of time. This guy here is there because he's the chief. And the brightest thing in the room is the exit sign. <laughs> and you Muppets are reading what this is about. Because delivery changes stuff too. It is not simply about having a great talk. It is not simply about having wonderful presentations. It is about, it is, and if you, you watch, it's, waste of time. It has to be well delivered by someone who engages the audience and makes them feel that this is worthwhile for them as an individual. Because if you don't, they vote with their feet. How many of you turned off online learning? Not many because there's that presenteeism, but how many of you got your phone out? How many of you opened up another tab on your computer? How many of you do other tasks while you're learning whether it's as simple as ironing or driving or flying a plane, I don't know. All of you recognize that you are that person because presentations suck. They suck not because you don't put the effort in as audience or presenter, but because this is monumentally confusing. This is horrendously confusing to be a presenter. Half of you are wondering about different people here. Why are we looking up her nostril? What on earth is that going on behind him? This woman's got a glass of wine, and this person has taken the vote. This is a virtual reality. Online learning sucks worse than live learning because of many complexities of science. And just because you don't know doesn't make it a problem. Here's a fact. So let's go back to that. The important thing is that I am not going to deliver you 300 references, because I know you won't read them. But what I want you to do, because you don't believe me, is remember three facts from the last presentation you were at, not here, because they've been amazing presentations. Okay? Just three facts. Because I know them, Matthew, I'm going to ask you to stand up and tell me those three facts. Terrifying. Why? Not because it's in front of people, because he can't even remember the last presentation. John, can you remember the last presentation? No. Science. Here's the science. Science says that we think differently than we deliver education. We process information differently. We retain information differently than we deliver in presentations. And this is neatly summed up in something called Bloom's Taxonomy, which you probably haven't heard about. 
I understand that you're an excellent, an excellent scientist, an excellent anesthetist or pre-hospital physician. That does not make you an educator. Anne was telling me that ski instructors in France study for four years, four years to become a ski instructor. They're good skiers, but they study teaching for four years. How much studying did you take in education? This is where we believe learning happens. It's the acquisition of new knowledge. That's the sundoku. It isn't. Upon knowledge, what we need is understanding. Above understanding, that will lead us through to the next level, which is not working, but it's an analysis of what that means. An evaluation of how we will do things differently, and ultimately the creation of new knowledge. Three facts from the last presentation you were at. No knowledge. Therefore, any understanding is flawed. The analysis, I wouldn't put much benefit onto it. And the evaluation, I don't want you doing a rapid sequence induction on me if you can only remember one, three, and nine. You cannot create new knowledge if the transfer of information is flawed. And the science shows us why that is. Just because you don't know doesn't change it. But you did not get your degrees in lecture theaters. You did not learn from presentations. Because reading out PowerPoint is not teaching. And yet it represents the vast majority of presentations. Worse, the corollary of that is that sat there listening to PowerPoint being read out is not learning. It's all gone very, very quiet. Because what you are recognizing is that is the truth. I had a woman burst into tears on me once when I said this. And she came to me afterwards and said, you have shown me why I felt a failure in education for the last 30 years. I thought everyone else was learning, and I knew I wasn't. That's not your fault as an educator or as an audience member. It's because of science. Now, some of you, being old, will recognize the meme that I've been using, which comes from a film called The Matrix. In The Matrix, Morpheus points out to Neo that the world is a virtual reality. And he says, you have to make a choice right now. Take the blue pill and go on believing that reading out PowerPoint and sitting there listening is education. That's fine. I won't be there. Or, because you are conflicted, because you see that there might be a problem, because you want to save your patients' lives by education, take the red pill. I will show you how deep the rabbit hole goes, and I will change your life forever and you will be an amazing presenter. You have to make the choice right now. Science doesn't care what you believe. Just because you don't know doesn't change it. And what Morpheus says is, remember, all I'm offering you is the truth, nothing more. What questions do you have? need the roving microphone people. Here she comes, getting her steps in. Thank you, Ross. Um, does presentation style matter? Does it matter whether I like the presenter or I don't like them? Uh, yes. Don't. Everything matters. Everything matters. The, any presentation is the product of message, media, and delivery. If I stand here giving you the same information doing this, it upsets people. It doesn't change the information, but it does make a difference. If um, someone is, uh, <laughs> here's a simple thing. If you stand here and look at the screen like this, and you're now looking at that, it makes a difference to you. Everything makes a difference. But one of the important things that I point out to people is, 
that it doesn't matter how awesome I think I am. I actually think I'm quite good at this, not because I'm gifted, but because I've practiced really hard. And like Dr. Levitan says, I've practiced the little bits to get better. It matters what this lady here thinks. It matters what this lady here thinks. It matters what the colonel thinks. Because it's your opinion about what I have delivered. So yeah, all of those things are important, but in the mind of the audience, individuals, not in the mind of the presenter. So style, no, it's not that I ever want anyone to be like me. I would desperately coach you to be otherwise. Be yourself on a good day. Yeah, I honestly can't see if people have got their hands up. Yeah, friend over here from Kentucky. Oh, that, that was superb. Um, I Thank hardly, you. I hardly know where to start. So, so what is the role of the slide? You could get up and give an oration, and we would all be glued to you. Yeah. But we need some visual content. What, what is the role of the slide? So the answer to all of these questions is the workshops on the mountains, and we'll come back to that. The simple answer to the, the slide is this. If you can't speak without your slides, then all you're doing is reading your slides. There should be some value from your slides in adding to your talk, but it must never be your script or the handout. What we have to do is stop copying other people and watching what they do and thinking it's good. I always say this, and I love it. this atmosphere. I watch anesthetics the whole time. That doesn't make me any good at them. So the slide has a role. It should illustrate the message. It should never be the message, and it should never distract the audience, because it's like that text I gave you. The, the audience are forced by psychological principles to focus on the text. And that's why our professors, when they say, I want more text up there, what they have realized is they will want to read. And they and listen to it over here because it's better to have just the slides. So figure out the purpose and have one message per slide. And if I find any of you overlaying them, I notice the worst offender left. Overlaying is an appalling thing to do to slides. It's psychologically massively confusing. I can explain this all later. Somebody's waving at the back. Hello. Hi. So, John, I'll finish in two minutes. Hi, Ross. It's Mantas. Mantas. Uh, yeah, I'm playing a ball to you now. Okay. Uh, so, I would say that I am. I, I think it's. Uh, I'm cr critical of your approach. Good. If I am not delivering uh, references and hard data on the slides, then this conference has no meaning. It's just a bogus, you know? Okay, Albert Einstein presented the theory of uh, relativity without any references. You're saying he was bogus, yeah? We have learned bad habits of putting references up here and feeling that, that that justifies what we're doing. Did any of you check any of the references I put up there? No, you don't. If you want the references, I will give them to you. The belief that they need to be up here is a bad habit that people have shared. It does not justify you. It does not prove that what you're saying is scientific any more than saying Kosslyn et al. in their seminal paper of 2014 showed that there were 93 psychological principles that were broken. It's something we do. The science shows that that distracts people. Mostly what happens is they go, I need a picture of that. So they get the phone out and try to take a picture. Because you put it in tiny subscript, in this hole, you can't see it because it's the bottom of the screen. And now you're stressed, and what you have not done is listen to me for the next 30 seconds of what's going on. References are essential. That is not a document. Okay, the aim of this talk was to be polemic. That's get you to think. By thinking, whether you've taken the red or the blue pill, you are all now better presenters than you were before. If you've taken the blue pill, go skiing, go mountain climbing, have a wonderful time. If you've taken the red pill, there are two opportunities to come and discuss this with me because this is not how to do it, it's just making you think. We're going to be at the Gonograt Cafe at 13.30. We'll be in the cafe chatting. Anyone can come. You don't have to do anything other than listen, but if you've got questions and an open mind, that will be brilliant. Then at 15.30, at the blue bar, at the top of the Blauhart, we will be doing the same. There may be beer involved as well, but only one because I'm going to ski down afterwards. Let me conclude by saying this. Science has detected that there's a problem. 
with our presentations. You all told me you believe in science. I know it's difficult. I know it's challenging. I know it may shake the tree on which you have been happily living. But please, you will save lives by improving your presentations. Please reboot. Thank you, Ross. That was fantastic. So, enjoy your...